Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this discussion on weed science and research. Um, we're going to let the webinar fill for just a, a couple of seconds here, and then we'll get everything kicked off. Again, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. We're gonna wait about another minute for the web room to fill and we'll get started. You see uh, my slides and hear me? Sure can. Um, Dr. Culpepper, if you'd like to get us started, I think we're good to go. Hello again, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, session of the WSSA and the USDA ARS. Uh, my name is Stanley Culpepper, and I want to welcome you um, to this session, and we appreciate your attending. And I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Dr. Stephen Young. Steve? Yeah, thanks, uh, Stanley. Appreciate that. So again, welcome everybody to the uh, uh, Weed Science webinar series. And if you've tuned in previously, we've talked about a number of topics under the theme of um, tactics. So the past couple of webinars, we've talked about Biocontrol, Integrated Weed Management. And today we're gonna to finish up that theme of this series and we're gonna talk about uh, new technology. So we have got an individual here with us, a weed scientist at, uh, with ARS. So Dr. Steven Mursky is a research ecologist in the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Laboratory at the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center uh, in Beltsville, Maryland. Uh, he's quantifying how management climate and soils interact to impact crop and weed performance with the goal of merging precision and sustainable agricultural practices. He accomplishes these goals by assembling transdisciplinary research and outreach teams that include partner, uh, partnering with farmers, commodity boards, and industry. Uh, he's helped to found and co-lead GROW, the acronym for Getting Rid of Weeds, uh, a National Public Research and Extension Integrated Weed Management Network. Uh, Stephen is part of a team developing an open access national weed image repository and low cost weed species and biomass um, mapping technologies. Uh, this work includes developing web-based decision support tools for agricultural professionals and farmers for real-time decision-making and long-term planning. Uh, today he's going to talk about the National Integrated Weed Management Team, GROW, and their contributions to herbicide-resistant weed management for researchers, farmers, and agricultural professionals. So before I turn it over to Dr. Mursky, I want to also remind folks that uh, we will be able to answer questions at the end, so hang tight. Um, I'm sure we're going to have some time for Q&A, so uh, be sure to get your questions down. You can actually use the chat if you'd like or the Q&A, either one. Um, and we'll try to get those uh, to answer those at the end. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. So go ahead and um, let's hear what you've got to share with us. Uh, thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for uh, letting, you know, inviting me to participate in this uh, event, this webinar series. Um, I, I do want to mention that my abstract was a, a little bit uh, lacking and that it, what, it, what it should have also included is that this is really 
meant to be a presentation that features um, sort of digital weeds work within ARS as a whole. And so there's a number of other ARS scientists work that is gonna be featured in this presentation. I'll be sort of starting off with some of the work that I'm involved in just because um, there's a number of folks that are involved and it also provides an opportunity to sort of give some specifics about what goes into computer vision and AI around um, species identification and mapping of weeds. And then I'll sort of close with giving some examples of, of researchers in ARS that are also doing this work in various different types of applications. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Couldn't help but not showcase this incredible uh, video content that came out of uh, Blue River and John Deere on you know, precision weed management is just sort of, you know, cultivates the imagination on what is possible going forward. And, and I think that um, that's really the take home message here from my talk is that um, computer vision and AI, um, you know, high performance computing capabilities on the edge, this is sort of transforming what is possible, particularly weed science, I think is one of the disciplines that are just so dramatically impacted by these technology advancements. You know, we can, from a research perspective, we can now, you know, measure and monitor individual plants in the field. That's just kind of mind blowing, right? I mean, all of us in weed science have been spending our careers trying to figure out, uh, you know, the most uh, parsimonious way to count weeds, get on our hands and knees, count weeds, cut weeds, you know, identify them, measure them, weigh them, all that jazz. And it's tedious, it's slow, and it's imperfect, right? Because weeds are very, uh, um, heterogeneous in fields, they, they, they're in patches, so you can be, you know, map, map you can be measuring and, and monitoring areas of a, a research plot or a field that has very low weed dynamics in them, uh, I mean, weed presence and, and areas that have high populations. So the ability to sort of now measure at the individual plant level, estimate biomass, quantify fecundity, I mean, it's sort of just a game changer for research and about enabling us to really advance what is possible within the discipline. From a farming uh, perspective, this is also, you know, providing all sorts of opportunities for growers for, you know, near to real-time decision-making as well as long-term planning about their fields and having much higher resolution knowledge about what's going on in those fields. And I think what's really exciting is sort of, we're one of the disciplines that's seeing some of the most integration with engineers, right? I think that sort of a lot of the disciplines are sort of, you know, operating in silos, but you'd see a really strong interaction between the engineers and weed scientists that really create sort of this next level applications for the discipline and producing the next generation of, of uh, scientists that are sort of these hybrid applied scientists with these types of skill sets. So really excited about the future. All right, maybe we'll advance the slide here. So here's just to make the point that, you know, it, it's, it's not a novelty. This is not something that's coming in the future down the road. The robots are here, right? This is sort of the future of weed science, whether it's um, tractor mounted technologies that like Brew River is developing with their, you know, precision spray applicators to these, um, you know, smaller, uh, more versatile uh, types of robots that I'm featuring here. This is where the discipline and this is where the industry is going. And it's, it's really here at this point. So I'm gonna feature GROW, which is a team I'm pretty excited about. It's a national integrated weed management team that ARS had the foresight to um, fund and, and, and help establish this sort of national network that's focused around integrated weed management. Uh, a heavy emphasis is on technology transfer, extension and outreach. If you go to our website, you can see that this is sort of a one-stop shop for integrated weed management solutions. Uh, and it's continuously expanding. The resources are, 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 are rich in this team as far as sort of that extension outreach focus. And you'll see more and more content coming online. Um, and, and just a shout out to a number of our key leaders like Michael Flesner and Mark Van Gessel who have been uh, key leaders in that activity, but, but a lot of folks have been, been generating a ton of content with that team. Uh, anyway, so Grow as a Whole also does a lot of common experiments on station on farm research, focus around multi-tactic uh, weed management. And what I'm going to do is showcase sort of the digital weeds team and what they've been up to. Uh, part of our success is that we've built strong partnerships in the public sector as well as public-private partnerships. 
Uh, we have collaborations and funding coming from commodity boards. We're collaborating with a number of technology companies uh, and you know, agribusiness, agrochemical, uh, as well as private on-farm research networks. So, so really rich and growing. And, and I may not have fully updated this list, so there's could have, could have missed some partners or uh, things that have evolved in the last year. So computer vision and AI from the grow perspective, you know, we're really focused on merging precision agriculture site specific solutions with the more sustainable uh, IWM strategies that are available to us and sort of merge that type of approach so that we can you know, modernize and, and get broad scale adoption with IWM. A lot of us have been focused on IWM for many years. Uh, and I think that we've, we've seen a very slow adoption of these types of practice in the landscape, but we see much more IPM adoption from the disease and the entomology side uh, and the weed side, um, we've sort of been victims of our own success. Uh, but uh, you know, now that we're having more and more resistant biotypes and challenges with um, some of the chemical control options we have, we're seeing more and more uh, integration of IWM and GROSS seeks to sort of help provide that support and, and information during that, these transitions. Key focus from the digital weed side is, is building a national image repository, which I'll explain in greater detail what that is in a second. Um, and then applications of that image repository include sort of performance mapping, like you know, mapping weeds from a density and a biomass perspective. Uh, and then um, we're also looking at some you know, niche applica applicators, you know, sort of control mechanisms that, that these um, computer vision and AI's uh, models would feed into. Uh, and so there's some examples of, of some folks doing this work in ARS as well, uh, in the back end of this presentation. So some of the, the state of the science right now, why are we building a national image repository, right? You know, so uh, there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years on really building, you know, high quality image repositories that map the crop. And so, okay, we know exactly which plant out here is the crop, and then everything else is the weed. Right? And so that allows us to put these, you know, bounding boxes around everything that's out there. And, and some of those red boxes are grasses too. So differentiating between grasses and, um, and the crop, which is a grass. But still the point is, is just it's weed and crop. And there is a lot of wind there, right? There's a lot of opportunities, uh, especially in these fallow systems. You see broad, broad adoption. In, for example, in, in, in Australia, you see a lot of momentum in just, you know, uh, maintaining uh, weed-free fields where just see something green, spray something green. Uh, but here are now what we're distinguishing in the swings crop and everything else. Uh, but we really want to know what, what are all those plants in there? What are all those species? So this is a bounding box approach and certainly a pixel-wise uh, annotation allows us to then also get sort of this the cover and the distribution of weed versus crop. But again, we want to know what are those species in there? Because that has a lot of implications both from a research perspective as well as you know, you know, management for growers. So that's why we're building this high resolu resolution uh, open access image repository. So we're trying to sort of knock out the, the bulk of we you know, weeds in, in, in North America. And, and we're really heavily focused on agronomic weeds right now. Uh, and I'll, I'll describe sort of our workflow in this image repository. Uh, we're, we're taking both a semi-field and a field approach. Uh, and we're, we're doing this from weeds at the cotyledon stage all the way up to fairly mature weeds, although we do have some limitations at the very upper end, but we're you know, capturing it as pretty, pretty large mature weeds. Uh, and we see this as a, a national resource, right? That this is a public resource that folks in the public sector can innovate and build on this repository and use this for their various applications with, with robots or research applications. We see the private industry can be building on these solutions. So it's a resource for all. It sort of provides uh, an opportunity for a, a lot of industry to, and startups to also scale because it's really hard to build these image repositories, right? You, you know, industry to be able to get all of these weeds and generate the images needed is very hard to do that for the diversity of species out there. Whereas you know, distributed ARS scientists and land grant university folks can do this well uh, and over time can build sort of this public good. So here's the semi field. We're not doing this in the greenhouse. I'm just showing you some visuals of what this will look like outside. Uh, we're not doing this in the greenhouse because there's some evidence that that growing under glass, the surface conditions of a leaf can affect its um, the ability to sort of detect what that species is. And I'm not gonna go into great detail about that. So it's sort of gonna be done in a semi-field. As I mentioned, these extensive image repositories from weeds all the way up to about 45 
uh, centimeters tall in the semi field. So this is just the semi field, not the full field uh, part of the repository. The first year, so we've been spending the last two and a half years working out the technology, building this bench bot, which is this autonomous robotic platform, working out a lot of the data flow, building the infrastructure, testing the cameras and the technology, selecting the cameras. There's been a tremendous several year effort to build up to this moment. And then this year, in the next couple of weeks, we go live with launching the image repository at, uh, for 27 species of weeds, some cover crops and some select cash crops. Uh, and so here's some visuals, for example, these outside locations that where there'll be benches and we'll, the, the um, bench bot robotic platform I described will go across these benches. Uh, this is in North Carolina. This is in Texas A&M. This is uh, some of our camera infrastructure. Um, you can see that we're going to be growing the semi field in pots. Uh, I mentioned the target size and um, some details on the camera. And here's sort of uh, we're really proud of this Benchbot product. It's a third place in an open computer vision competition. It was a North America competition that we took third place in and sort of the innovation around its use in, in developing these image repositories. Uh, here's sort of some working on this hardware inside. There's just a little video that we're training this to be fully autonomous so that it'll uh, uh, go across a bench and continuously collecting images across the entire bench. Uh, and both be autonomous in that it's collecting images across the bench, as you can see the camera moves from side to side, but then we're also training it to be able to track along the bench uh, lengthwise. This is a potent tool for building the image repository, uh, for doing phenotyping in the greenhouse, but it's also a great product just for testing different camera technology and, and developing camera technologies in various different you know, applications so that we can prototype it on this autonomous robot. Oh, I think I already played that. So let's walk through the uh, semi-field image repository here and sort of the workflow. This is sort of just an example of, of sort of early uh, efforts before we, we've gone live with, the, with, with Benchbot, but you can see here sort of the backdrop would be these like, you know, a, a black, you know, landscape cloth and black pots and dark soil so that you could see that strong distinction with the green there. Um, so the camera has the ability, you know, with an RGB image, we can do uh, structure for motion. So it'll give us a lot of depth information about precisely where every pot and every plant is, where the camera is on every single photo it takes. So that way we can stitch together images and map across the entire bench, know exactly where we are. This is, helps us kind of track metadata on which pot has which species in each pot. So we're sort of, you know, planting the seeds of every weed species in these pots so we sort of can automate the annotation of these weeds at the semi-field uh, step just because we already know what those species are. But then other ways that we're automating this workflow is that we can then, um, you know, put bounding boxes around these weeds based on sort of their uh, color distinctions. And so you can sort of just put a box all around those weeds. And then from that, that bounding box, so sort of automating sort of the selection of those weeds, we can then extract those specific images associated with each of those weeds. And then we can apply a, a pixelized annotation to that. And that allows us to cut out the entire weed. And we're doing that just based on these color differentials. So this is sort of automating, right, this process instead of sort of hand tracing these weeds. So it's huge time saving. And then we can take these weeds um, and we can impose them on different backgrounds. So you can see here, we can twist them around this cutout. Um, so here's some of the example of that, right? So now we've got all of these weeds that we've cut them out and we can impose them on different backgrounds, different soil types. We can train them in high residue, low residue systems for folks who are using cover crops. We can put them into tillage-based or no-till systems, you know, sandy soils versus heavy, dark, you know, uh, you know, silt loams and what have you. Um, and then we can superimpose them in all sorts of different densities here. And this allows us to create um, uh, a, a set of training images, what we call synthetic training images, to further train their neural nets to be able to have higher precision in um, the identification of species when they're growing in these different mixtures of other species of weeds and crops. 
And this is just an example on the right here, sort of what it takes to hand annotate, super time intensive process. And so we're saving massive amount of hours with our sort of automated approaches versus sort of these manual cutouts. And, and that it's not just huge time savings, but it's also a lot of money. So this sort of enables us to really do the kind of scaling that we're talking about. So now let me introduce sort of where the, the rubber meets the road on some of the team. So the core team that has this robotic platform is um, there's there's folks at Texas A&M. Uh, many of you know uh, Mutu. Uh, we have um, uh, Chris Ruber Horton and Ramon Leon at um, NC State and myself at uh, Beltsville, Maryland. Uh, and uh, we're you know kicking off a number of these weed species per year as well as some cash crops and cover crops. And every year we'll continue to expand that repository from the semi field perspective. And that's where you know folks around the country will be shipping us seeds to be able to build out that repository. We certainly can't do the same step for the field where you need those naturalized populations. And that's where sort of other members in the GROW network participate. And then this weeds 3D where we can developing a tool for density and biomass mapping. You can see those folks are, are sort of the users of the technology and some of the calibrators. So the red and the orange box uh, uh, states are both helping with the calibration of technology as well as um, the, the deployment in our different uh, experiments and such. So here's a, a little uh, look at the field image repository now. So you can see we're sort of really putting in the extra effort to still put sort of these backgrounds of these mats around weeds that's kind of, you know, throttle the weeds so that we can sort of still automate the annotation process, get the highest quality images and not have to, you know, separate it out from all the other plants that are out there. And so here's an example of what that's going to look like and um, sort of the, um, the rollout and the scale of this that you can see here on the left and using the same camera system, but, you know, slightly different flash technologies, as you can imagine, for the field. All of these sites, all participants are using the exact same camera technology. It's really important that we're developing very high resolution in repositories. Um, and you can see here sort of this, what we're doing in the field with that monopod. You can see that monopod that right here, this long pole. Basically just from moving it four times across as we walk across that, around that weed, we shift the angle of that camera. So we're making sure we're getting multiple angles and viewing angles of these weeds as we build this image repository. Very important for training uh, the neural nets as well as sort of having um, a diverse image repository that can serve different use cases. Some folks are just using cameras in nadir mode. Others are gonna have an angle to wanna be able to serve up those different um, applications. So that was the 2D image repository and everything associated with it. I'm just giving a quick little shout out to Mutu's lab at Texas A&M, who's helping to lead sort of this effort and, and bring this to our team as for also looking at a, a true three-dimensional approach to developing an image repository. It's in the early stages, but it's a really exciting a pipeline that could potentially uh, become you know, a larger part of our future. And so just want to give a shout out to that effort. It's a big effort. And, and Cheng Sung is sort of leading that effort in Mutu's lab, so. Okay, so now applications for the image repository. Everything I presented right now is sort of like, how do you build an image repository so that you can train a neural net to say, is that a pigweed? Is that a foxtail? Is that a corn plant, right? What is the species out there? That's the sole purpose of this image repository. But there are now lots of applications for an image repository. We can use an image repository to quantify weed densities, for example, like you see uh, in this image. We can use it to map fecundities. This is another uh, effort by uh, uh, Matthew uh, Kutegata, who's a, a graduate student at Texas A&M, uh, who's quantifying fecundity of weeds. Um, we can also use this for biomass mapping. So this is sort of that um, using structure for motion to do a 3D reconstruction of that plant so that you can then get these point clouds to estimate volume. And then uh, we can be using this for um, quantifying biocontrol, which I'll, I'll give a, a brief uh, uh, slide on that in, in a bit by an area scientist, um, inform drone applicators for precision spraying. And then certainly, oh, here's the drone uh, that you can see in sort of point spraying. Um, and then, you know, this is sort of some of the future precision, precision technologies for really, you know, 
variable rate, you know, and, and localized applications for individual weeds in a field and, and a whole range of different robotic applications. So to sort of serve up these use cases, these various different applications, the way that workflow begins is that you take these very high resolution images that we've created under a set number of parameters for the, the color uh, parameters of the camera, the high resolution quality of the camera, and then you degrade those images and you set them to sort of the color scheme characteristics of, of the any one camera that is going to be using that image repository for a given application. And I'm going to talk about this GoPro application now, but sort of wanted to uh, you know, understand sort of how the image repository then serves a given use case. So the image repository is helping for the species identification. And in this case, we're using the GoPro for both uh, research plot scale, as well as, you know, to mount to um, tractors to map the biomass of weeds and cover crops and cash crops. So here we're using this for, you know, standardizing research across a network. And you can see these you know, tablets so in real time, you can be monitoring what you're doing. You can walk across your research plots and then map um, using the image repository for identifying the species and then um, structure for motion for estimating biomass. And this is sort of what this workflow looks like that sort of walk through this. Um, we've got this GoPro camera that's collecting the, the video. We then dissect several frames because, you know, video is just a, a series of images stitched together. We select specific frames. In this case, we put this pole and a ball there because that gives us a known dimension that we can, you know, calibrate um, our images and, our, and, 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 the, and the depth information. And so then you get this 3D point cloud of this transect that you've walked across that plot. And, um, and this is sort of how you get your, you know, we start to start go down that biomass estimation. And all of this stuff in the middle, just sort of ignore this. This is sort of our steps for the calibration team. We have a whole team of folks across the country that are, are calibrating this technology. And so this is sort of this calibration step. Uh, simultaneously, we have the image repository that's feeding into the semantic segmentation part of this, right? So we have the we have images of these plots and those images are then being um, you know, stitched together. And then you know, we, we apply that neural net to then so, you know, appropriate one of the species in that uh, strip. And then we combine the species map to the um, biomass or the depth map. And that allows us to get sort of an estimation of both the species and the biomass that's out there. And this is just a more simpler, I, was going to give this slide, not the other one. I forgot to delete the other one. This is really the workflow for sort of broad users. Here's just an example of what this looks like. For the training, we set a metronome. Can you hear that? To help sort of standardize the pace. Obviously, our tractors, you're not going to need to do that. Um, but this just sort of gives you a sense of what it looks like to take these videos. And, and really the, the bounce also with the footsteps is an important part of this workflow to calibrate against. Now I wanna just introduce another technology because we're really excited about the application of this camera system. And I think this is sort of a big part of our future. This is sort of doing the same thing, but in a different approach. Before we were using structure for motion, which is very compute intensive. It requires a lot of computational capacity. Um, it's not something that you can really do in real time. It's very expensive to do it in the cloud. And so it really kind of requires that downloading of that, of those videos and, and processing it uh, not in the field. Whereas this, um, this is including an RGB camera in the center here, just a single RGB camera. And that's what we use for our species identification. That's how we develop that um, semantic uh, uh, segmentation a map of the species that are out there. Uh, and then we have stereo cameras that are of a known distance apart. And that's what allows us to get this depth map. Um, and so we sort of on the fly in real time can identify species and build a depth map, which is sort of much faster, much less compute intensive. Um, and it's it sort of um, allows us to um, sort of move the science in this direction where sort of what we see is sort of a lot of industry is going, right? A lot of industry has been using LIDAR um, historically, and we see more and more with, with um, for example, you know, autonomous cars and all sorts of autonomous technologies, more and more they're using these stereo camera capabilities because they have less limitations 
especially in outside conditions. So we're excited about kind of this approach and moving in that direction. Here's sort of a protocol. And what I really want to highlight here, and this is going to give me an opportunity to um, jump into infrastructure. This kind of work requires broad teams, large teams, multidisciplinary teams, which requires lots of cyber infrastructure and community of practice. We're developing extensive, you know, uh, uh, Google Docs that real time protocols that are updated that everybody have access to. We have these documents we can go right into and see like this is the web apps that we're developing. So folks joining this project, if you're a user or a developer, you click on which uh, applies to you. And then this is a way to automate a lot of the metadata that's needed to link to these videos. So just a lot of infrastructure that goes into supporting sort of multidisciplinary teams like this. In all of our workflows, we keep it on GitHub repositories so it's transparent. Everybody can see exactly the kinds of the work we're doing and, and, um, and how we're approaching our science. All right, um, now to uh, switch gears, uh, I'm gonna give um, uh, some use case examples of other scientists in ARS that are taking a, this you know, sort of digital weeds approach to um, their research. Uh, so here are uh, some work by uh, Melissa uh, Smith. Here she is um, working with uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, so UAVs, to uh, take images of, of rangelands as well as aquatic ecosystems. And, and what they're doing here is developing the ability with flying at low heights with high resolution cameras they're being able to do some species level identification and mapping. You know, for the audience here, it's very hard to do species identification from drones. It's not an option from satellites. And for most applications your drones, you really can't get species level identification. But where you don't have high diversity of numbers of species and you're flying really low and have high resolution cameras, you can start to map out those species. And here then they're being able to sort of map these in aquatic ecosystems and rangelands. And they're also able to track their biocontrol practices. So they're deploying biocontrol practices out there. And then through these, um, uh, workflows, they're able to map how much herbivory is happening, how much of those herbivores are impacting these invasive weeds. So really sort of exciting applications here for invasive weed management. Um, here's a, another example, uh, era scientist uh, Daniel Martin at Texas A&M, uh, who's collaborating with uh, Mutu Bhagavathinian, who I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, here's where they're doing um, uh, spot spraying of uh, on on turf grass, you know, in golf courses in this application here, uh, with um, these uh, types of uh, applicators, and you can sort of see on the right here this untreated uh, plot here where the weed has not been controlled, and you can see just from backpack spraying on uh, versus using this you know drone technology, this image based system here, you can see that they're able to target the weed from the image-based system and, and it automatically goes and sprays that weed. You can see high degree of, of efficacy. Um, here's just another visual of, that, of this. You can see um, uh, Dan in the photo here. And um, this is some applications in some field crops. You can sort of see the same here, uh, targeting some resistant weeds in the field. Uh, and you can see here that the untreated versus the backpacked or the, um, the remote piloted aerial application system. So important to differentiate that, sorry, between drones that I mentioned earlier. These are you know, auto, automatically able to detect, see and spray the weeds. And you can see they're able to stop the weeds before they reach, reach maturity. So they're not producing viable weed seeds and sort of impacting the overall seed returns to the system. And this is a really cool video that highlights that. All right. And just some e examples of this in a rice field. So sort of more green on green applications, you know, detecting the individual weeds and targeting them and spraying them. Um, so here's another group uh, in uh, Mississippi, uh, Rachel Fletcher and, and Krishna Reddy. 
Um, so be presenting some of their work here. Um, some of their early work with UAVs were sort of sort of mapping um, you know, various vegetation indexes uh, and how that's how the yields of the crop were impacted by uh, dicamba spray. So here they're sort of testing the effects of drift injury on soybeans and sort of the rates and how well they could detect this with RGD imaging. And you can see that they have really strong relationships by um, uh, mapping both the, the injury uh, on the soybeans using sort of these drone and, and vegetation indexes. So some of their conclusions, these remote sensing systems are versatile and complement satellite aircraft and ground-based systems. Um, they're very effective at ultra low altitudes and provides, you know, provided you're using these high resolution images. And I want to sort of reiterate that, that it's really hard to do species level identification with drones. And so it does require some accommodations, uh, but you can see they're having some success here. All right, some additional work they're doing with um, hyperspectral uh, mapping of weeds. So they're you know, training uh, these hyperspectral cameras on various different weed species. And really what they're trying to do is being able to track resistant versus susceptible biotypes. I think just think this is the coolest thing here. So they're, um, oh, let me go back here. So they're, they're training to be able to detect, um, is, is this a susceptible biotype? Is it a resistant biotype? And be able to do this here, you can see in a soybean uh, field. Uh, and you can see here from these um, from their analysis where they're looking at sort of the um, the ability to differentiate between susceptible and resistant biotypes that they have a very high prediction accuracy, um, both in the greenhouse and in the fields, just really high. And um, and then this is sort of the wavelengths across the, the 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 hyperspectral. You know, these hyperspectral cameras are taking endless number of. Um, uh, different bands. And so this is sort of, they've identified sort of the key bands that are for, for detecting um, this dynamic, you know, this susceptible versus resistant uh, biotype. And, and then they've sort of looked at sort of genetically heterogeneous versus homogeneous or pooled uh, populations out in the field and sort of quantified which wavelengths are sort of the best criteria. You can see it sort of holds up fairly consistently across. So really good work for helping to sort of map out these resistance in the field. All right. And um, they're expanding this work to include a number of different uh, species. Um, and, um, and you can see here um, that they're developing this hyperspectral systems and scouting capabilities with drones. And I think sort of this key goal of theirs is not just for this mapping and then going in and, and, and training these uh, drone systems that can spot spray, but they also want to be able to be mapping in real time, again, as they're going out and doing management. So continuously improving the maps and the information of what's going on in the field. So like you've taken a map of what's going out there, you inform a technology to go out there and, 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 and provide control and then be able to continuously map while it's doing that. So it gets, continuously improves the resolution of the information you have in those systems out in the field. So that's sort of the, threads that I wanted to capture today and give you some sort of use cases, examples of what we're doing with uh, digital weed management in ARS. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. That's great. Um, I see we have a number of questions, but before that, before we get to those, I wanted to ask you first, just because you're kind of, you know, at the cutting edge of this whole field of, of technology and weeds. And, and so where are we at with um, adoption, because it seems like the, the tools are available to, to growers, perhaps, and, and probably, you know, ag consultants are using these, and, and I'm sure, you know, some industry folks are. So are we kind of at the cusp of, we're going to see this explosion of these tools all of a sudden be used, or what's your sense of that before, just kind of you know, from what you've seen, or where are we at with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't, necessarily want to uh, suggest that I have a, a, a firm you know, finger on that pulse of exactly where we are at from the industry side. Um, I, I think you're seeing, like right now, we are just seeing a surge 
in the weed science, you know, weed science, uh, weed control world, right? Like, I mean, every other week, a new robot comes online that can control weeds, right? So this has clearly got the imagination of roboticists, engineers. Um, you've got a lot of folks, certainly in the public sector, but I'm seeing startup companies left and right. So and in fact, there's a number of startup companies in Europe that have really already have high degree of traction. I think in Europe, particularly, they've sort of been far more receptive to some robotic weed control, and there's been much more adoption. I both think sort of both the interest in sort of non-chemical weed control and just sort of the research community there has been sort of pushing this box forward, you know, really hard and fast. So I see, I think we have a lot of adoption there. I think we're starting to see more and more traction in the U.S. from a range of these different types of technologies and practice. And so I, I think that What's coming online fast is that the research community is learning how to make this more and more affordable, right? How do we develop low cost systems? And then you saw our example with the image repository, right? That's an, like that's sort of that proof of concept early development, you know, that that you know it's so expensive for the private sector to do, right? So we're sort of de-risking that solution, right? Think about all the, the university salaries and ARIS sciences salaries that are all collectively going into sort of populating this image repository. So that's slow and tedious work. But once you have a resource like that, to be able to build and innovate on that and use sort of the, and the camera systems that are coming online are getting lower and lower in cost and the data flow systems are getting better and better. So I think that we're sort of at that precipice that, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of a thing. And so we're certainly optimistic that the release of the image repository will have a pretty big impact on that. But I think we're already starting to see, you know, a lot of use cases. I, I think where I see the most traction right now in the U.S. is cotton. Yeah, and it seems like there's there's a real need for it. You know, there's these there's these specific applications where it's it's fitting what the needs are. So I think that's that's really exciting to see. So I want to get to some of these questions. I don't know, Stephen, if you can see any of these, but I'm going to start in the chat because I've got uh, one right here at the top. That's uh, this is from Michelle. She says, "Any thought on the likelihood that that with the visual repository and digital detection of weeds, that the next natural step in evolution for weeds would be visual mimicry to trick robots uh, like the Viceroy Monarch did to trick birds. <laughs> so. Well, I, I think everybody in weed science uh, ha knows that um, weeds find a way. They, they always find a way, right? There's, there's the amount of selection pressure we're putting out in the landscape is tremendous. And so weeds always find a way. And, and um, you know, we've sort of been always playing this cat and, cat and mouse game with them. And, and sometimes we're, we're winning that battle. And sometimes, you know, we, we take a couple of hits and take a couple of steps backwards. And so um, I, I can't really say how this is going to play out. Do, do, it, what is, is what's being suggested at high likelihood? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, how quickly that comes online, it's hard to tell. And I think that sort of one of the great advantages is that the, these uh, computer vision and AI applications is not one tactic. They really drive chemical controls. They drive mechanical controls. Um, there's a whole range. It, it, it precipitates a range of cultural management strategies that historically were not available as well. So the, the tools in the tool belt are growing as far as the non-chemical control strategies. And I think that's going to help keep the weeds guessing for a while. Yeah. And I also think, I mean, just taking a picture, I mean, you're not putting pressure on, you're not actively, you know, um, doing something where it's, it's going to have to evolve or adapt. I mean, I think then when we, when we make our applications, yeah, then you, you're going to see that, but taking picture, probably not, but that leads to the next question by Amanda. She says, um, there's maybe more of, of the issue of confusing weeds versus the crop. So, you know, your work on distinguishing the weed from the crop, is that a, a, a real challenge? And kind of, you know, what are the, what are the trade-offs be between mistaking crops sometimes versus missing weeds? Um, I guess the short answer is, is the technology can do it, right? So that's, and that's not in question anymore, right? The technology capabilities of distinguishing between a crop and a weed is there. Um, it, it, a part of it is absolutely, you know, on the quality of the image repository, the, the depth of the amount of images we have. Uh, we all know that crops and weeds have high diversity of morphological characteristics based on how they're grown, where they're grown. So climates and soil and management 
sort of drive those morphological characteristics? So uh, the short answer is, is that we need lots of data, right? You know, this is a very compute, this is, you need a lot of images to train good neural nets to really have that consistent performance, but we're already showing very high precision and very high levels of consistency. Um, and the, the, the deeper uh, we go with the image repositories and the more training we can provide, the better this is gonna get. And I, I, yeah. I'm not overly concerned about that. Yeah, and they've been working on that for, for quite a while. So I think that's, yeah. And that's actually what the what the technology is specific for is the, the differentiating between you know different organisms. Um, we've got a question about aquatic um, species, and this is probably related to Melissa's work on UAV. Any any spot application you know for aquatic species using UAVs? I I know of some, but I don't know how extensive it is. And maybe you could um, touch on that a bit. Uh, if Melissa is on the call, she could chime in, right? Yeah. Is she here? Melissa, I think I see you on the participant list. Maybe, Melissa, if you answer that in the chat, I see um, that might be the best way to do that. Let's keep going here. Um, uh, someone So someone wants to know about any notable open source code examples behind the heuristics employed by some of the these solutions, especially in drone delivered solutions. Is that a... I think you talked about open source. So you, you've got your, your um, you know, what you're doing is open source. Is, is that code available as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, everything that we produce are gonna be open uh, source, open access resources. So, I mean, we are building out the, these repositories in an open ecosystem. We're going to be, you know, providing all of the uh, documentation and it will be a public resource for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move over to the Q&A. Um, we've got someone that wants to know, so you talked about the Grow Network. Is that, um, are you taking additional, you know, partners? Um, are you open to having, you know, other researchers maybe join you? I, it's anonymous. So I don't know who, but is that something that you're uh, welcoming as well? Absolutely. I mean, this is a, this is a public good, Grow, and, and, and obviously I'm thrilled that ARS was be able to sort of help establish growth through area-wide funds in, in 2014-15 is sort of where it kicked off and, and ARS has um, provided an additional, you know, six years of, of funding. So sort of got like 12 years or, or so of, of, of support coming from ARS, but uh, Grow is a very distributed network. There's many, many leaders across Grow um, that are, you know, university, uh, ARS, and, and they have elevated Grow in, in many unique ways to sort of sustain and, and sort of expand what is possible and includes lots of public private partnerships, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we're, we're really a very open and inclusive group and, and really are always looking to, to find new members. I mean, obviously, Part of partnership comes from where any one resource comes from and how we expand any one activity. So, you know, the way it grow is sort of, you know, we have, you know, sort of an a la carte relationship, particularly from the research perspective, right? Some research questions come up, folks want to collaborate on something, some folks will go after a grant, you might have, you know, eight or seven, you know, eight or 10 people go after one grant, you might have 30 go after the other. It just depends on the grant programs, it depends on the resources. Um, and the projects, and and uh, so we're you know, very inclusive in that regard. And then when it comes to the, I should give a shout out for the workflow for the field image repository. I mean, this is going to be incredibly challenging beast, right? The semi field, no problem. Three locations, robotic platform will not will be able to knock out all that semi field weeds, you know, in a number of years. Uh, it's all the field that's you know you know you really have to have these naturalized populations in your fields to be able to help build those repositories. So each year in the coming years, we're really looking for partners who want to participate in helping to build out the field image repository for species that are important to them and their cropping systems. Yeah, so I would encourage you, anyone that's you know viewing this, even if it's recorded, you know, reach out to Stephen or myself. I can connect you as well. Um, we've got a question on uh, this machine learning technology from Mike is asking about, is it... Um, Hone to identify weed seeds. Have you, is there any work in that way or do you know about any of that effort that's going on? Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I'm aware of, of if there's anybody in the GROW network has started that. 
uh, and Mutu usually does everything. So maybe Mutu will put a message in the text box here that he's working on that too. Uh, but uh, not as of now, have we tackled that? Like I said, I did present a slide from his lab on some fecundity work, you know, trying to estimate fecundity. Uh, but there is a group, uh, Ian Burke in the Pacific Northwest, that is starting to tackle building image repositories around uh, weed seeds. And I um, believe that uh, Lauren Lazaro started some workflow regarding that um, in um, Louisiana, but I'm not positive. So if any of those folks are on uh, the chat uh, line, please message them. Yeah, um, we have another question from Marty Williams uh, is asking about the, the the hyperspectral camera. So I'm just gonna go out on a limb here at Marty and say, Probably the folks to talk to would be um, Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Uh, um, uh, Krishna Reddy there at, at Mississippi, because uh, I think uh, Stephen, you you highlighted their work that's that's really kind of um, at the edge of this detecting you know resistant populations in the field, and and they're really kind of working on that. I, I'm I'm assuming that's that's the the folks to go to with with that kind of a question. He's asking a real real specific question. Um, yeah, they're certainly doing some really cutting edge work on that. Um, I, I believe that uh, Prashant in Iowa has done some work or continues to. I'm not fully up to date on all of the work he's doing. Um, and I, I suspect there are others who are tackling this hyperspectral question. Yeah, we got a question about um, the sustainability and specifically is how does weather affect it? So can you go use this in the pouring rain or, you know, when it's windy and, and gusting wind? I mean, what is, are there limitations as far as, you know, how you can use the technology in the field or is that um, kind of an unknown yet? Or what is, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, well, obviously uh, one of the great wins here is that you're working with um, sensors that are deployed to uh, tractors or for researchers or handheld. So you have high degree of flexibility. Um, it's not like you're dealing with satellites that you're hoping for no, no cloud cover. So you're already sort of having larger windows. Um, one of the reasons we're moving for, our, um, for the, uh, and again, there's a lot of different use cases and applications for an image repository. The image repository is just, you know, high resolution images that have been annotated, right? They can then be applied to lots of different applications. It's every application has its own unique set of circumstances and the models and the, the, the their neural nets you build are unique to that camera and that technology, right? So we're building sort of this core based resource the application we're developing uh, is this biomass estimation tool, what we call sort of weeds 3D. And um, in that case, the use of, uh, you know, we, what we're finding is, is that at least there's a strong evidence that the, the reason why part of the industry, sort of like the car industry is moving away from LIDAR, moving to stereo, is because it does have higher uh, flexibility in, in different environmental conditions and weather. And, and, uh, and so that's part of why we're moving in that direction. Where's that edge? I, I, I will, we'll, we'll have to start testing our technology in tornadoes and we'll let you know. What do they call that? Extreme weather chasers or something? <laughs> we want to see what the weeds are doing. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, so, uh, and I think this is, you're answering actually a couple of these other questions about um, the appearance of a weed at different stages, maybe different. So, so is that being captured in your repository? The the, the very early germination, the cotyledon, all the way up to, you know, s s the larger size weeds. Are you, you're capturing that as well? That's right. Okay. That's right. We're right. going all the way from the cotyledon stage up to mature weeds. Um, and then um, at the younger stages, we have very high density and we're thinning back the populations over time. So we have like really high numbers of seedlings that really, you know, jacks up the number of, of, of images per plant. Uh, that is slowly declining as the plants get bigger. And as you imagine, as the plants get bigger, the ability to identify it, you know, improves. So it's, so we'll have very high um, uh, quality data set. I mean, image repositories around these young seedlings, but, but certainly extending to beyond. And for a lot of our interest in sort of weed mapping from a biomass perspective, it's that more mature biomass is the target. Um, got another question about expanding this. Um, I mean, you talked a little bit about aquatic systems, um, and then you showed the, um, you know, in, in, in turf grass, but, but have you seen this, you know, 
firsthand or any, you know, they were like applied to rangelands, natural areas for identifying and mapping weeds on these very large scales. I mean, your, your experience with that or what's your, what's your kind of perception of that? I have a narrower experience and as, as any good ARS scientist always knows, we, we avoid speculating beyond our uh, expertise at, at public uh, venues like this. So I, if there is, I know there's, I've seen some of the names of the participants. You, you have some of the best experts in the country on this call who are far more experienced than I am in that arena and, and or more experienced in general. And so I, I think that if any of them can chime in, that'd be great. I'll sort of give my very quick and dirty uh, response, which is, as I mentioned earlier, species level identification is really hard, right? The characteristics of species really require sort of like this sub centimeters or millimeter level resolution. And so drones, it's really hard to do that with because of the height. And um, so what you are seeing is more and more folks doing these really low flight patterns and very high resolution cameras, and they're having some success with species identification. How well is that working on like, if there's like five or eight species sort of overlapping in the same space? That's a question I have. My impression is, is that you can sort of get that to work when you have more monocultures or sort of bicultures out there, but getting species level distinction and like very diverse number of species across large landscapes with um, drones is hard to do. And in general, that's sort of, um, I think, the lane that we've picked with some of our applications is because sure, we have satellites. Sure, we have drones. Drones, your, your, your satellites are never gonna have the resolution we need in this application. Um, and drones are always fighting gravity. Whereas every single farmer is gonna have to drive across every square inch of their field, no matter what, whether it's a robot, whether it's a tractor, you're always going to be driving every square inch of that field. And when you're out there driving every square, square inch of that field, we want cameras on those booms mapping. And so that's sort of the lane we're picking is we know a camera on a spray boom is gonna give us all the information we need. And so that's sort of why we lean into that. That's obviously a very different storyline than what can be done in ranches and rangelands and and uh, and so that's why I'm sort of lost. Yeah, in yeah, and that's actually good. Um, you know, kind of a a reminder that we are going to have we're going to hit that topic uh, towards the end. Our last um, our last uh, theme on impacts. So we're going to hear from uh, a number of folks that work in rangeland systems. So I would encourage you guys to to you know um, attend those, but. Yeah, it's a, I think it's an emerging field as well. I think this technology piece is really something that's, you know, in a way, maybe you're not using it as a researcher, but you're aware of it, you know, as, and then if you're not, you know, I think there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of opportunity to collaborate with computer scientists, engineers, you know, like we've never seen before. So that's really what the excitement is, I think, and seeing this really being applied in a useful way. I think that's really, you know, cool to have. Um, so I don't know if Melissa is able to um, come on, but I've asked her to uh, join us because we've got a couple of questions on the aquatic um, aquatic uh, area. So if she's able to, otherwise, uh, Stephen, I guess the um, we've got another question. Oh, she's in the chat. So Melissa, if you're in the just, I think that might work best. If you're in the chat, just uh, address questions. And also, can you put your email? So if people want to follow up with you, can you um, put that in there and then folks can reach out to you. Um, so uh, last last question here, um, again, kind of around the grow topic um, and, and you kind of, you know, address this a little bit, Stephen, but as far as this collaborative effort between private industry companies on digital weed management, I think that's that's one of the hallmarks of grow, is it not, is where you're not just focusing on the research, but you're also connecting to industry and to partners that, you know, are, are really in some ways outside of the agronomic realm. So is, is are you, is, is that, is that true essentially? <laughs> I wanna... Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we're, uh, Grow is partnering with, you know, a number of equipment companies from the perspective of harvest weed seed control. So we have a number of different uh, uh, equipment companies that are producing sort of technology and hardware that can be used for the harvest weed seed control. And so we have that technology embedded in, you know, research stations as well as sort of, I think like 16 or 18 farms across the country. Now we're doing that on farm as well. So we do on farm and on station 
uh, research. Uh, we have uh, a number of private partners um, who are um, in the uh, agrochemical uh, space, for example, we're collaborating with um, you know Bayer on a number of this Harvard Sweet Sea Control studies and IWM economics and sort of sustainability targets. Um, we we partner with you know folks in the technology space, you know, sort of these um, uh, software and hardware companies that um, can help us sort of on our innovation, our data engineering pipelines. Uh, so yeah, there's there's sort of broad, rich collaboration, and it, it's really sort of um, built at the grassroots level, right? So we have a, scientists all across Grow who are elevating um, various different pursuits, and and then sort of you know the coalition of the win at willing, right? So you have folks who are sort of excited about any one leader in GROW and what they're proposing and sort of coalescing around those leaders for various different pursuits. And, and so you have different folks who are bridging those relationships with the these public-private partnerships. Um, does that kind of get at the question? I sort of think I lost track of what the question was. I think so. Yep. The company industry partnership, I think it's, it's very evident. And if you ask... You can go to the, the, the GROW website too. I think you'll find that that's, that's all there as well. So um, so we're at the top of the hour and I, I know I try to keep these to an hour and I really appreciate everyone joining us today. This has really been exciting to, to talk about new technology and I, I appreciate uh, Stephen, your, your willingness to share your work and you know all the, the great insight and the, the great collaborations that you're developing. I'd encourage folks to contact Stephen um, if you've got follow-up questions. Um, but I just want to give a little plug for next week. So we're going to uh, start into a new theme on mechanisms. Uh, and we're going to hear about the role of plant physiology in weed crop competition. So put your basic research cap on and, and start thinking about some of the fundamental um, aspects of, of weed management. So um, again, thanks everyone for, for coming out uh, next week. Same time, same place. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you and uh, having more discussion about weed science research at, uh, at ARS. So thanks again, everybody. Take care.